How you guys doing tonight? Tonight, uh, the parable that's, that's defining this general session called Cost of the Kingdom is the parable of the, of the pearl merchant. And the, and the parable goes that the pearl merchant found a pearl of great price, and he went back and he sold everything to have it. And that's why we're calling this, this general session Cost of the Kingdom. And man, I'm, I am like beyond honored to be on this stage before these two next gentlemen. One of them, I, I was going to say that, that he's given 50 years, but he, he corrected me. He said only 49. He's given 49 years to the cost of the kingdom. And his name is John Perkins. And sharing the stage is Shane Claiborne, who has given the last 10 or so years and has, has vowed to give the rest of his life to the kingdom. When they bombed Baghdad, Shane Claiborne was in a children's hospital in Baghdad. These two know what it means to count the cost. And they've sold everything to buy that pearl of great price. Let's give it up for Shane and John. Let, let me read that passage again here. Uh, <laughs> uh, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking a godly pearl who when he finds one of great prize went and sold all that he had and bought that pearl. I guess the first thing you'd want to know here is uh, what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God. He's lacking everything here to the kingdom of God. It's a whole series of, of parables he used to talk about the kingdom of God. And so the kingdom of God is sort of a mysterious idea, the mystery of the kingdom. So what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is where the people of God is doing the will of God, recognizing that Christ is in the midst of them. That's the kingdom of God. Then, what then did this pearl symbolize? The idea here is finding the kingdom. Finding the kingdom. What then is this pearl? This pearl, of course, this pearl is, is Christ. But what is this pearl? This pearl is to find your longing, your aspiration, your hope. It's finding absolute meaning and significance. It's all of that that we are seeking in life. We are seeking meaning, significance, fulfillment, joy. All of that we are seeking in life. The pearl is that. Once you find that pearl, once you find that meaning, the rest of it is is gratitude, what you are calling the cost. And I think that's why you got Shane and I here. You think some way that we have made some sacrifice. You think that we have paid something for that. That would be by works. That would be by works. We would have found it through our own seeking. And that would have been by works. When you find that pearl of great prize, 
you have found the longing and the meaning of life you no longer have to seek you no longer have to do something for yourself you're no longer seeking self-satisfaction and fulfillment you have found fulfillment and you have found meaning and then you can sing hallelujah I have found him whom my soul so long had tread Jesus Jesus satisfied my longing and the rest of it is no sacrifice the rest of it is trying to embrace him the way you have been embraced in life that was my story my mother died when I was seven months old my father took the five of us me being seven months old and dropped us off at my grandmother's house his mother she had been the mother of 19 children my mother died of a disease that has to do with nutrition deficiency my mother died of starvation if you read the congressional record of 19 and 57 and 67 when I testified before the Senate McGovern nutrition committee I talked about my mother's death and how she died I didn't discover all of this until I was a grown person until after I had uh, come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Then I grew up in Mississippi. I dropped out of school when I was somewhere between the third and the fifth grade. I never went back to school. My grandmother gave away three of the kids because she had too many. She had been the mother of 19 children. And so I grew up in the poverty of uh, Mississippi. I left Mississippi after my brother was killed in a racial incident after World War II, after he had come home from Germany. And my whole family then left Mississippi. I did not see, I'm not the typical black Baptist a charismatic Pentecostal. I didn't grow up in this religious environment. Uh, I saw religion when I grew up, something like Karl Marx. I saw it sort of like the open of the people. I would see our black folks living in, mo in poverty and misery and the segregation. And then I would see them go to church and go through a shouting and, and all of that, but it had nothing to do with removing of that oppression. All they did a little act to me was accepted more by, and that religion became an outlet for oppression. And then they would go back. There was no way they was organized to throw off that oppression, so I rejected it. And when I'd go down the streets in Mississippi and I would see all these large black, white Baptist church that would say, religion tonight, religion today, everybody welcome. Well, if I'd have went there, I'd have been a ride. Everybody didn't mean everybody. And so I saw the hypocrisy of religion for what it was, the reality. I saw it as the open of the people. It was an escape from reality in society. And so I rejected that. I moved to California, right just a few miles from here, Monrovia, California. I moved there as a boy, never expecting to go back to Mississippi to live again. I'd experienced the poverty. I'd experienced my brother being murdered, and I experienced all of that that had never been in Mississippi until 1966, a white man ever being convicted of a bodily harm against a black person. Because the Constitution of all the southern states said, back in those days, the black man had no rights that a white man had to accept. The whole idea of the voter's right struggle that you saw about it wasn't a struggle just to vote for the least of the evil because the constitution of the south said one person one vote we was going for personhood we we was going to be person and we didn't become person in mississippi until 1965 with the coming of the voter right and the civil rights act and so i came to california I was looking for 
meaning. I was looking really for what I thought would be that pearl of great pride. And all the good things that could happen to a third grade dropout almost happened to me in this valley. I was a young black in Monrovia that people thought I'd made it good. And I was thinking that I'd made it good. I had my job. I'd been in the service and had a job with a company in this part of the era that became a monopoly. So I was a young third grade dropout that had made it good. But through the influence of an organization that's called Child Evangelism, they got involved, my little son, Spencer, at that time was about four years old. And he went to those little clubs and he heard about Jesus and he fell in love with Jesus. And he came home singing a little song that they didn't sing in Mississippi. Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loved the little children of the world. See, I grew up without a mother. I grew up without a father. I grew up without the institution of love. What I was seeking in life was love and significance. I thought I was seeking money and success. My big house, my big house is there, there in Monrovia. You can go by there and see it. I had that. But then he, my son invited me to go with him to a Sunday school. And in that little Sunday school, for the first time in my life, I heard the message. And I heard that message in Galatians 2.20 where Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ live in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me. Who loved me. I heard that. I heard that. The pearl of the great prize was to know that there was a God in heaven and that God had sent his only begotten son into the world to die for me because he so loved me. He loved me. When I realized that, that I was loved by God, I said, I want to love that God back. And when you find, when you find the pearl of great prize, you find the fact that you have been loved by God, you have found meaning, and you are no longer seeking meaning and significance. You are living your life out in response and gratitude to this God. That's what mission is all about. It's about your gratitude. Your, that's why you sell all that you have and go out do that. Okay. Well, my story's a little bit different. I uh, was raised in the backwoods of East Tennessee, and I'm from a little family where I was the only child and the only grandchild on both sides. I had no cousins or anything, and so uh, that's a lot for a young lad to bear, you know. And I, I was raised on a road where my grandmother died this year, and they took me up to see where she was raised. And the name of the road that my grandmother lived on was Old Hag Holler. So it's a small town, you know, and I, I actually, uh, I pretty much had all my stuff together. I was pretty pampered. I was on an upward track to make a lot of money and buy a lot of stuff. I actually... Uh, decided I wanted to go to med school and become an anesthesiologist. Those are the folks that put you to sleep before surgery, and I figured, like, I could do that and let somebody else do all the dirty work, you know, and just make a lot of money doing very little. And, uh, and then, uh, sorry for the anesthesiologist, but and, and, and then, um, 
you know, I was, I was in the in crowd. I was homecoming king. I know that's hard to imagine. It was a small town. And, uh, and, uh, and then I, I uh, you know, I went to worship, and I went to, the, I was smothered with Christianity. You know, East Tennessee was the Bible Belt, so we had like, I went to four different youth groups, you know, but what the church did was the church entertained me, you know, like we had these weird games like Chubby Bunny, you got that, you know, where, right, you'd stuff a lot of marshmallows in your, in your mouth and almost die, and then you would, the youth pastor would be like, Any, do you want to receive Jesus? And you're like, I saw the light on the other side, I'll do it, you know, and like, we, we played weird games where we had like um, the Velcro wall where you put on a sticky suit and you jump and stick against the wall all for Jesus, you know. And the church had very little to say about the world that I was living in, though, you know. And I went to one of the youth festivals and I, um, I got born again. And it, there's not a lot to do in East Tennessee, you know. So then I went the next year, and we all got born again again. And, you know, we did that like six or eight times, and it was awesome every time. If you haven't done it, I recommend it. But, but then I realized something. You know, I realized that the church was just entertaining me and just promising me that I would go to heaven after I died. The church was telling me that there was life after death, and I was just wondering if there was life before death. You know what I mean? And, and I, the, the church was telling me to lay down my life, but they weren't giving me anything to pick up. They weren't giving me a, a pearl of great value. In fact, when I looked at the church, there was very little that I would want to give up to join it. And, and I thought, you know, as one of my friends, he, he was one of the ones that went forward and gave his life to Jesus. And then he got busted with acid in, in his high school just a little while later and I was like bro what 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 went wrong where did why did that happen and he said I don't know I was real sincere when I came to Jesus but then I just got bored and I thought God forgive us you know if we if we lose this generation i'm convinced that it won't because it won't be because we've made the gospel too costly but because we've made it too cheap and i think that's that's the the pearl that we've given young people is often not the pearl that's of great value but it's kind of like a cubic zirconia you know it's like this little fake thing that we want people to come to jesus but not the real jesus you know we want people you, you look at i looked at christians and, and they taught me how to believe something differently, but they didn't teach me how to live differently. In fact, I was told that good people go to church and bad people go to jail. But I looked around and I saw a lot of good people that went to jail. Amen? But we don't teach our kids about those people, you know? And I looked at the people that go to church and I, I studied sociology. And uh, one of the things I saw was that actually the higher a person's church attendance the more likely it is that they will be sexist, racist, anti-gay, pro-military, and committed to their local church. And I thought, is that really the movement that Jesus had in mind? Is that really the movement that I want to give my life to? And so I went on search for a Christian. I went on search, and I you know, I like, I like Mother Teresa, so some of us just wrote her a letter, and we said, we don't know if you give internships out there in Calcutta, but we want to come and work. And I'm not real patient, so eventually I just started calling around, and I ended up calling nuns, and finally I got through to Mother Teresa, and uh, she, she answered the phone, and I'm like expecting a polite, you know, answer over in Calcutta, and I just hear, hello. I'm thinking I got the wrong number, you know. I'm like, I want to come out and work, and she says, well, what, 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 how long do you want to come? And I said, well, I don't know, a few months, you know. And she says, well, come on out. And a bunch of us went over to India, and we, we lived and worked with her, and we saw people that had given up everything in their life to be with the poor. But I think I made a mistake in that I, I thought that, like, the kingdom only belonged to Mother Teresa, you know. And then I started seeing around me people like John and so many others in this room that were leaving everything to follow after Jesus. And I thought, that's the kind of Christian I want to be. That's the kind of love I want to experience. And I, I went after that. And I found that, like, that gospel's gotten me in a heck of a lot of, uh, of a lot of trouble. I don't know about you all, but, like, 
there's all those people out there that, that say, you know, I was sleeping around, partying, drinking, and then I came to Jesus and everything came together. God bless you, you know, but for me, I had my stuff together and I fell in love with Jesus and it's messed me up, you know. I'm, I'm still recovering from my conversion, you know. I, I fell in love with folks in Philadelphia that were homeless and I'm trying to Philadelphia, come on, the, the city of love right there. And, you know, but the city of love, the, the, fo the homeless folks in Philly started calling it the city of shove because we started arresting our homeless folks and they started making it illegal to, to feed people on the streets. And so a lot of us said, you know, in the face of that, we're going to continue to love our neighbor as ourself. And we went to jail. You know, and I, I remember going to jail as we were sleeping in one of the parks against the law. It was Ill we were charged with disorderly conduct for sleeping. I don't know how you sleep, but, you know, so I went to, you know, there we were. And I'm in, I'm, I'm in jail, and, the, and the, the police officer takes my Bible from me, right? And he says, I'm like, you can't, you can't take the Bible, can you? There's no metal in there. It's the sword of the Spirit, you know? And, and uh, he takes... He takes my Bible from me and he says, no, 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 this is a dangerous book. And he winked at me, you know, and I know he was joking. But the fact is, you guys, this book has gotten a lot of people in trouble. It's gotten a lot of people locked up. It's gotten a lot of people killed. As we saw in the video, this is a, this is a gospel that is dangerous. You know, and I, I, I hear Jesus now, and the scriptures say that when, they, when the demons hear Jesus, they shudder. And most of us Christians, we don't even shudder anymore, you know. But I think like now, if we heard Jesus, it should be kind of like this thing that we hear Jesus. We're like, whoa, that's dangerous, you know. Watch that name, you know. You, you've seen the Lion King where the, they, they're Mufasa, you know, and the, the hyenas are like, Mufasa, whoo, say it again, you know. And I think what if, what if it were like that, that people said, Jesus, whoo, say it again, you know. And it's. It's that Jesus that, you know, in the middle of the conflict that I saw in Iraq, it was that Jesus that I thought about Jesus. I thought about Jesus. And I thought, how could it, how could it be more clear what love looks like when it stares evil in the face? Maybe, maybe you've seen the passion and you've seen what those people are doing to him. If you haven't, just read the book. You know, it's better. But, you know, as, as they're killing him, he looks into the face and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And I praise God for a Jesus that loves evildoers so much that he died for them. And, and I say, if we believe that evildoers are terrorists, or who, no matter how evil you are, how evil those in our world are, if they are beyond redemption, we can rip out half of our New Testament. Because it was, it was written by a converted terrorist named Saul of Tarsus. And that's the kind of love that I saw that and I said, you know, as I see the pearl of Jesus, I can see that there is something worth dying for. And that's what I think our young people want. They want to hear, they want to be challenged to the heroic. They want to know that there's something worth dying for because if we're not ready to die, then we haven't truly lived. And I think that's the Jesus that, that challenges me and teaches me that there is nothing worth killing for, but there is something worth dying for. And that's the pearl that I've fallen in love with. I look at Jesus and I'm just like, I would give everything for that. I hope. I'm getting there. You know, I look at John and I think, oh, man, if I can just get one more little glimpse of the dazzle of that pearl. And you guys, when I got back from Iraq, this, this friend of my mom, she came up to me and she said, how dare you? She said, you, do you know what you put your mother through? And she said, Jesus should be shaking his finger in your face saying, how dare you be so reckless with your life? And all I could say was, what Jesus is that? What Jesus is that? The Jesus that I've grown to love teaches me that I believe in resurrection. And I think a lot of us Christians, we don't even believe in resurrection anymore because we're so busy trying to protect our lives and we're going to find that we can save our life, but we'll lose it. But there's something, this pearl, that we can give everything that we are to, and we won't be disappointed. After I discovered that 
Christ loved me, uh, I really wanted to love this God back. How could I love this God who had loved me enough to send his only begotten son into the world to die for me? Well, I was blessed. An old white Presbyterian elder who was an elder at Lincoln Avenue Presbyterian Church became my disciple. I can say this, young folks. Jesus called us to be more than what we call Christians. He called us to be disciples. I think what we are doing today, we are making Christians without discipling them. We are making Christians without really helping to shape their character. The idea of discipleship is to shape our character. And to shape our character, we have to uh, bring the, those virtues that are found in Galatians 5 that have to become a part of our life. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, that constitute one virtue. And it's called the fruit of the Spirit. And so I went to this old man and I said, you know, how can I love this God back? This God who loved me enough to send his only begotten son to die for me. How can I love him back? And I can remember like it was yesterday. He asked me to open my Bible to Matthew chapter 25. Where Jesus says, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was in prison, you came to visit me. When I was naked, you clothed me. And he said, as much as you are doing it for the least of these, my disciples, you are doing it for me. That's how you love God back. You, it ain't no accident that Jesus said when he was incarnated here on earth, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. The way we evaluate our spirituality and our conversion experience is our attitude towards the four. James asked the question, do you have the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ? If you have the faith of our Lord, faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to care for the poor and the broken. True religion and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows and to keep oneself unspotted before the world. The whole idea is that we have to live a life of holiness, a life of commitment to Jesus Christ. Well, this old man discipled me. Three years later, I found myself in Mendenhall, Mississippi. In 1960, it was there for the first time I really saw the poverty and the suffering of a people. And, and I could see that success for those young people in this little town of Mendenhall, there had never been a black boy who had ever graduated from college to come back to this little town of Mendenhall. Success for those young black folks was to leave that ghetto and not come back. And I could see that. God opened the door for me to work into the public, go into the public school and hold evangelistic every week. I was, every month, I was reaching 15,000 kids a month in the school and two junior colleges. I thought I'd be doing that the rest of my life. And then when graduation time would come, six months later, I wouldn't find those kids. They was in L.A., they was in Chicago, they was in, they did not at all tie education to changing the condition in that community. Education was to get out of there, and the poor was getting poor. The, little, the few little businesses that blacks had had. Now, these educated young folk, they leave, and those blacks get old, and those businesses die. And so in the ghetto, all we were becoming was consumers in that community. We wasn't providing any goods and services in that little neighborhood. And I said to my wife one night, I said to her, honey, if we're going to make a different little, little town of Mendenhall, this is what we got to do. We got to stay in this community long enough that we can win some of these young people to, to Jesus Christ. 
We got to disciple them in our faith. We got to help them to get a love for God, a love for themselves, and a love for the community. That's a greater love than consumerism and materialism. Then we're going to have to help them stay in school, go off to college, and come back to this community. This became our task. This became the seed for what we now call Christian community development. How do we do that? So we came up with what we call the three R's of Christian community development. You got to know your goals. You got to have a purpose. You got to organize your life around a purpose in order to achieve a goal. Most of religion today is self-serving. Most of it is for me to go to get my praises on. Most of it is what God can do for me. Most of it is for God to bless me. Most of that is what religion has become. It has become a sense of prosperity, success, and how God can bless me in the world. It is not for reaching out to those who are hurting and trying to build a community where people can develop, where there can be some goods and services that's provided for the people so that they can have some merchandise and do, pr pr provide their skills and sell those skills and services to the community. All we have is consumer thing and materialism in our community. That's what it was. All we had was a little honky-tonk at night. That was it. All we was doing was trying to satisfy ourselves, and that was violence and death. And our young boys going to prison, and our girls getting pregnant at 13 and 14 years old in my community. I realized, how can we do that? And so you have to come up with a philosophy that achieves the goal. Religion is more than yourself. Religion is building a community, building a church, building a body in there, and recognizing the fact that we need each other. How was he going to achieve that? The first R then was relocation. We had to get those young folks to go off to school, get some skills, and relocate back in the community. Relocation is incarnation. Relocation burns through our pride and our class system. If Jesus loved us enough that he would come into this world and die for us, why shouldn't we go to the poor and the oppressed and live among them? He came and lived among us. And so we could see that. The second aura was reconciliation. That's what thrilled me about this meeting. Being here this week, a Hispanic, overcame some of his bigotry, Larry, and said, come, come, come and join with us. We want to be reconciled. And he raised it. And today, all of us are here, black, white, Jews and Gentiles. We all, God wants to use each one of us. Racism is out. Racism is bigotry in society. Centric is gone. It was as Afrocentric, European centric, or any kind of centric. We've seen the end of that. I saw that in Adolf Hitler. That was European centric. I saw Afrocentric in Idiot Amin. That's Afrocentric. I'm seeing now Arab centric in Bin Laden. That's nothing but death. The Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So the second hour is reconciliation. The third hour is what we call redistribution. You know, when I talk about redistribution, people always think about you taking all the money from the rich and giving it to the poor. That just means we have deified money. That means we have deified money. That's what scares so much. We think money is the pearl of great prize. If you take all the money tonight from the rich and give it to the poor, the rich will have it back tomorrow night because the poor will go out and buy you a Mercedes. It's rich people that hold money. That would be the cheapest shot that ever been. I want you to know that there is something more important than money. And that's the tools and the skills that money is made out of. And what we need is love, compassion, skills, education. That's what money is made out of. Boy, I have rejected these poverty slogans. They've got those for us. For the last 30 years, we've been 
because I'm victims of some welfare government program in our society that have undermined the very businesses we once had in our community. And they come up with these ideas like give people a fish and they'll eat for a day. Teach them how to fish and they'll eat for life. That's a lie. Whoever owned the pond ah. determines who eats fish. So, so redistribution, redistribution is helping people to bring some ownership back to the neighborhood. Some ownership back there. Bring some schools back there that we own and we control. Some business enterprises back to the community that we own and, and control so that we can participate in carrying this gospel to the end of the world. That, that's the kind of uh, gospel I think that gets us in trouble, right? You know, you heard the saying, when I, when I fed people, they called me a saint, but when I asked why people were hungry, they called me a communist, right? And I think that, that when, when, when John's saying things like that, those are the, that's the daring risk I think that we need today, though. You know, where, where we don't just feed people, but we ask why people are hungry, you know? And I think that's, that's the kingdom that collides with this world, because when you start to ask those questions, you get in a lot of trouble. When you do charity, you win awards, but when you do justice, you get put in jail, you know? And, and I think that when the scriptures say the kingdom of God you know, is not of this world, so don't be surprised when the world hates you. Some of us should wonder if we don't feel hated by the world, are we really preaching the gospel, you know? And for me, I start to wonder that too, because sometimes you get like a lot of applause. Like in Philadelphia, we, um, Christianity Today did this story on the community, and they put us on the cover, you know, which is a little weird, because on my more cynical days, I called Christianity Today, Christianity Yesterday, because I thought they were all, you know, but uh, the, like I, I start to wonder when people are giving us all this praise, I, I, I wonder, are we really being faithful? Because the scriptures say, woe to you when people speak well of you. That's how they treated the false prophets, you know? So write me some nasty letters or something, you know? But, but I, I think the great thing, uh, uh, getting back to the parable, is that the parable is not about the person who gave up everything, but it's about the pearl. You don't even have a name for that woman or that, that man that gave up everything. And so it's not about... John Perkins or Shane Claiborne or CCDA or new monasticism, it's about the pearl. It's about the pearl, and the pearl is little and beautiful and subtle. And I think that when you find the pearl, the, 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 you, you can't just go around flaunting it. You know, hey, look at the great pearl. You know, you almost have to just let people know, hey, check this out. It's a secret. You know, don't go around shouting the gospel. Go around whispering the gospel with your life. Live in ways that are magnetic. And that's what I love about John and so many of the other Christians is the credibility that their lives have. That we're just magnetized to the gospel that they've lived. And, and the pearl is little. It's, it's a little thing. Not like a, a giant jewel, but just a little pearl. And it's, it's that pearl that I think is almost hidden in this world. That we've got to live in subtle ways and invite people to live differently too. And the parable is not about it's not about what we give up. You know, people, I think, look at John or myself and they think, man, you, got, you, got, you have given up so much to follow Jesus. It's not about what we've left, but about what we've found. Amen? It's, it's, you know, the Scriptures say we can sell everything we have and give it to the poor, but if we don't have love, it's nothing at all. It's not about what we've said no to, but what we've said yes to. And, I, you know, I, I've said no to some things. When you say yes to Jesus, you've got to say no to some things, right? I, I've said no to an economy that's based on the seven deadly sins. But I've said yes to an economy that's built on this interdependence of mutuality and love that promises there's enough for everyone's need, but there's not enough for everyone's greed. You know, I've, I've said no to an economy that says, blessed are the rich, and let's give you 50 billion more dollars worth of tax cuts, amen? But I've said yes to an economy that says, blessed are the poor. I've said yes to an economy that's built on the back of a homeless baby refugee. I've said no to the American dream that I think a lot of us see, have seen that the world may not be able to afford that. But I've said yes to the kingdom dream. And that dream is not just something I hope for when I die, but it's something we live now. Now is the kingdom. Amen? 
I've said no to the kings and presidents and emperors of this world, but I've said yes to the king of kings. I've said yes to the king that rides a donkey, not a cross, not, not, a, not a horse. He, he doesn't take up a sword, but he takes up a cross. I've said no to just my national allegiance, but I've said yes to an allegiance that runs deeper than nationality or biology or tribe or nation. I've said no to the wisdom of smart bombs, but I've said yes to the foolishness and the folly of the cross and of enemy love. Amen? We've said yes to reconciliation. We've said no to racism. We've said yes to something far more beautiful than anything this world has to offer. And that's not that heroic. In fact, we've just given up the stuff of earth for a pearl that makes all of that just like, look like rubbish anyway. We've found a treasure, haven't we? And I think that treasure is worth giving our life to. When, when, uh, when Mother Teresa died, these reporters called me, and they said, Shane, do you think that the spirit of Mother Teresa will live on? And I said, no, no, no. To be honest, I think the spirit of Mother Teresa died a long time ago when she gave her life to Jesus. And the joy, the compassion, the love that everyone is magnetized to in Mother Teresa is the Spirit of Jesus. And that will live on forever. That's the dazzle that we see in the eyes of John Perkins. He's not going to be with us forever. But the pearl that we see radiated through his life will captivate and obsess us with everything that we are. So let us give it to a give everything that we have, all that we, all the other loves of this world, all the other possessions, all the other obsessions that we have, and just glory in the dazzle of that pearl. Amen. Let's pray. Let us pray. Let us pray for you. Let us pray for you. Father, we pray for these young people, for this whole generation of people here who love you. Thank you for Shang and for his life. Thank you for Larry. Thank you for all of those who have found that pearl and who are now giving their life to your service. Bless this congregation tonight. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen.